Uh, thanks to everyone at the Center for Fiction for, for the work you do to celebrate the written word and especially the imaginative written word. Um, and thanks so much to Luis and Pam for being here with me this evening. Um, I met them, I met Luis over 15 years, yes, over 15 years ago at Fish Trap in, in, in far northeastern Oregon. Um, and I met Pam not that much long after at an AWP where we ended up doing a video in a park in Boston uh, <laughs> for somebody where we were answering questions and it was freezing cold and I forgot my jacket and looked ridiculous. Um, but it was a wonderful time. And I, there are two people that I have tried to, both as a writer and as a human being in the writer's world, model myself after um, for their wisdom, their work and their generosity. And so thank you so much for being here. Um, we're here to, to, to talk. Um, this is part of the Center for Fiction's On America series. And um, my book, Fall Back Down When I Die, um, is, is trying to be about this country we find ourselves in and, and even this space in this country we find ourselves in now. Um, there's three main characters in Fall Back Down When I Die, a young ranch hand named Wendell, who's just um, found out that he needs to be the caretaker of a cousin's young son as she's been incarcerated, a uh, public school teacher who lives in uh, the only city in Eastern Montana, Billings, and commutes to a rural school district where she's the assistant principal, and a man named Verl whose story takes place earlier, his story takes place in the 90s as wolves are being reintroduced into that country. Um, and he's, he's on the run from the feds, whereas Wendell's in Gillian's stories take place in 2009, the year of the first legal wolf hunt in the state of Montana. Um, but because this is part of the On America series, I thought I'd read two short sections, and these are both sections of backstory, one from Wendell and one from Gillian. And they're both sort of trying to speak to the ways that they're seeing the world they're in. Um, they're living in the same part of the country, though they're looking at it from very different ways. Um, and to try to speak to how how they begin to know who they are and the part of the world they're from. And so this is a short section from Wendell from when he's a boy in elementary school. When he was eight, he stole another boy's replica flintlock pistol. He had stolen another boy's replica flintlock pistol. God, but it was a pretty thing. The boy, a town kid named Daniel McCleary, whose hair was slicked and parted not far above his right ear, had stood up front by the chalkboard and passed the flintlock around for show and tell, told about his family's vacation to the Black Hills, the reptile garden, the water slides, the souvenir shop where his mom had bought him a pistol and a coonskin cap. Wendell ran his fingers along the gleaming wood, the cool, smooth black barrels. He cocked back the hammers and aimed at the chalkboard, pulled the trigger, snap, snap. The dual hammers fell like that, one after the other. The girl in the desk behind him poked his shoulder. Wendell gazed a moment longer, then passed the gun to her. He hadn't planned to take it. He'd just gone in at recess to use the bathroom, and there it was in Daniel's cubby. His muscles seemed to work at his bones of their own accord. He slid the pistol into the waist of his jeans, pulled his T-shirt over it. Outside, for the rush and noise of the recess yard, no one even noticed when he tossed the pistol into the evergreen bushes in front of the school, which is where, hours later, after the last bell had rung, as kids ran here and there and loaded themselves onto the buses, he slipped it into his backpack. That was after a whole day of anguish, though, because when they had all gotten back inside after recess, Daniel, whose father was the congregational preacher, and whose mother was president of the PTA and the Republican Women's Club of Delphia had blamed Freddie Benson for the theft. Freddie's folks had come into town a couple of years ago, moved their four boys and half a dozen caged birds and collection of lamps into one of the rotting Victorians that 80 years ago had been some railroad baron's place. Freddie's mother, who dyed her hair a startling orange two or three times a year, tended bar at the Snake Pit the only bar left in Delphia proper, and his father, an enormous man, spent most of his days sitting in an easy chair in the front porch where he smoked cigarettes and read westerns and romances and sometimes fell asleep with his mouth wide open for everybody to see. Freddie often hooked the romances and brought them to school. All the boys would crowd around him at recess beneath the jungle gym where they collectively tried to puzzle out the sex scenes. 
Freddie pilfered his old man's cigarettes, too, and had been caught stealing candy at the drugstore a couple of times. And once his folks had left him in the care of his older brother, always tinkering with his Trans Am in the front yard, and Freddie had put, put out bowls of raw hamburger to lure in a bunch of neighborhood cats. The local deputy finally came by and put things to rights, yet rumors swirled about what Freddie had done to those cats before the deputy arrived, tying them up in pillowcases and dunking them in rain barrels, duct taping them to one another, lighting them on fire. That morning after recess, Daniel cried and howled and pointed at Freddie, and the teacher called Freddie out into the hall and questioned him and eventually sent him down to the principal's office. Freddie didn't protest, didn't even look scared. Wendell was terrified. He couldn't concentrate for the rest of the day and ended up with his name on the board and two check marks by it. His old man had whipped him with a leather belt once, whipped him so hard he had to sleep on his stomach the next two nights for pocketing a dollar and change left on the kitchen counter. That afternoon, with a flintlock heavy in his backpack, Wendell got off the bus, waited for it to disappear down the county road, then hiked out into the bowls. On top of a butte, on a great slab of sand rock, he took out the pistol and laid it in the center of the stone like an offering. He'd never had a toy as pretty, was sure he never would again. He knew by his thrift store jeans and the thin walls of their trailer, the generic potato chips his mother bought, that his family was one kind of poor. He knew too that the Bensons were another kind, a sadder, meaner kind. He wasn't sure what the McCleary's were if they were rich or not, but they sure weren't poor. They had a maroon minivan and a green lawn and Daniel got new gym shoes twice a year. They could pass for the kind of people you saw on television. Wendell knew he and his old man couldn't, likely not even his mother, not even with her shiny hair and recipes from the morning shows. Whenever they drove down to Billings for groceries or to sell a load of cold ewes at the, at the livestock yards, Wendell felt exposed, scoured and windburned, angled and stiff. He'd been to the mall a couple of times, and he'd seen other kids his age, city kids, and they'd seen him. There were some distances you could not cross. Those geographies intricate, shifting, unmappable. That afternoon atop the butte, Wendell stood there in the wind and touched once more the polished curves of the pistol, then built a cairn over it, placing the rocks just so. Years later, after Freddie quit the basketball team and grew his hair long and pierced his ears, after everyone started calling him Fudge Pack Freddy, out dragging Maine along with everyone else one night, he drunkenly smashed his brother's Trans Am into and through the front of the school building at 50 miles an hour. Freddy lived, but the shock of it loosed something in Wendell. The next day he tried to find the cairn. He and Lacey, that's his cousin, hiked around all day and she kept asking him what it was he was after and he wouldn't tell her and they never did find it. Lacey was pissed. That evening, even though he had, he had a home ball game, she took the pickup into town without him. He had to wait for his mother and was nearly late. On the drive-in, he wondered if he'd made it all up, if he'd somehow misremembered. So many things had begun to shift and swirl that he was having a hard time sorting the world into reality and dream, into things wished for and things witnessed. Had he really stolen that pistol? Had Daniel McCleary, now the starting point guard and class president, really cried like that? If he drove to Billings, would Freddie be in a hospital with a collapsed lung and alcohol poisoning? Were they really going to win the state championship this year? He'd touch his mother lightly on the shoulder as they cleaned up after dinner. He'd bump into Lacey as they hiked the bulls, their elbows and hips knocking, their fingers brushing. He'd wait for the pass from Toby or Daniel, feel the whap of the ball in his hands, hear the ball snap through the net, the roar of the crowd. And for a moment, he'd know it was the truth and the world would stop its swirl but it always faded. The knowing, the roar, the touch, the twin barrels of the pistol, got slick and gone beneath his fingers. Um, so that's, that's a bit from Wendell's growing up in Eastern Montana. And this is just a, a really short section from, from Gillian's sort of story that the way she finds herself in Montana. Um, She's married a man from Montana. She went to the University of Montana, Missoula, but they've lived sort of this, this life of adventure, moving around. Um, and he's a, he's a forest ranger and they've found themselves now in Texas. And so I'm gonna pick up there just a real quick section. 
Alabama, Key West, Nevada, Colorado, and their longest stint was their last, Alpine, Texas. Kevin was stationed at Big Bend down along the border, and she was teaching at the high school just three blocks from the small adobe house they rented on the edge of, the, edge of town, the Davis Mountains rising to the, rising to the north, and the Chisos like dark, dusty rumors in the frame of the south-facing kitchen window. The shoulder to shoulder, they scrubbed the evening's dishes. One sunset, they drove south, turned off on a dirt road, then another, and finally pulled to a stop near a barbed wire gate that led to a remote spread of BLM land administered by the Park Service, a wildlife migration corridor recently declared off-limits to grazing. They left Kevin's green work truck and hiked the dry washes and creosote hills. Kevin kept reaching for her hand. She was four months pregnant. They spread a blanket on the brittle desert ground and lay back as the stars sharpened in the dark. Though Kevin swore the stars of eastern Montana were just as bright, just as numerous. Gillian had never seen anything quite like it. The way the land beneath seemed to lift them toward the perfect black bowl of night. Such a spill of sugar, salt. Hours later, after picking their way back by flashlight, laughing, planning, throwing out baby names, both beautiful and ridiculous, Evelyn, River, Gracie Ann, Cuthbert, they found all four of the truck's tires knifed. The headlights shattered and scratched into the driver's side door. Fuck you, Fed. I'll kill you dead, Fed. She couldn't keep herself from spinning. Around and around, someone was there, she was sure. Someone was watching them, advancing each time she turned her back. These threats weren't new, but this was the most brazen. In one way or another, they'd been dealing with a slow erosion of respect for NPS, Forest Service, and BLM employees for the past 10 years, from Reagan's embrace of the sagebrush rebellion to the relative respectability of the now ascendant and even more radical wise use movement. And there had been trouble before, of course. A red-faced governor calling for privatization of public lands, ominous letters to the editor after the arrest of a rancher who refused to pay his grazing fees, and just recently, the trash cans out back of the ranger station lit on fire. But now, they were stranded on a gravel road in Texas, stranded in the purest dark she'd ever known, and there was a violent idiot out there with a knife, or maybe worse. Kevin tried to take her by the shoulders. She cursed and pulled away. He tried once more to hold her, and she spun and fell on her knees in the gravel, cradling her belly. She wept. She loved this life, but she couldn't live this life. Not anymore. Kevin stood above her, spread wide his useless hands, said, sorry, 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 sorry. On the ride home that night, they talked. They had to leave Texas. They had to find a place they could imagine raising a child. The next day, Kevin started looking for work. The best of what was available was Montana, where she had kept up her teaching credentials, where they had felt, if not at home, then at least reasonably safe. There wasn't anything near Missoula, which would have been their first choice, but there was an opening for a game warden out of Roundup, just west of Delphia, where Kevin had grown up. Kevin's mother was still on the home place, and though he wasn't especially close to them, so were his two older sisters, their husbands, and a handful of nieces and nephews. The county school wasn't much but Gillian could supplement their child's education. While game warden was still a government position, it was a state post rather than federal. And Kevin knew most everyone living out in those mountains. There wouldn't be any surprises. Even though he'd gone off to college and turned his back on ranching, let alone farming that dry country, it was still where he was born and raised. It was home. Now, I think that's a talk, right? Oh, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> Turn the light on. Well, I have a question. Just I have a couple of sort yeah. of craft related questions to get yeah. us started. Um, and you didn't read um, Verl's voice. Yeah. Uh, Verl is uh, Wendell's father who isn't alive at, during the present story of the book, but yeah. his passages are you know, both glorious and horrific. Um, and so uh, he, he's writing as he's on the run from the law, basically. Mm -hmm. And um, 
they're short and very poetic and full of amazing lyricism and also violence and um, you know, yeah. they're truly terrifying. So I'm just curious um, how it was to live with that voice, where that voice yeah. came from in your imagination. Um, how did you keep it from taking over the book? <laughs> Uh, cause it is so powerful. I'm just curious yeah. about how, where it came from and how it worked in. Yeah. Rural is actually the voice that began it all. Um, so I had a short story published in Orion magazine, um, eight, nine years ago now. Um, and it was Verl's voice from front to back. And his voice came to me, um, partly because of, I was living in Iowa at the time in the Midwest and I was looking back to the West. And so I was looking back at the West when wolves were delisted Montana and there was the first fair chase wolf hunt. Um, I was looking back at the West as the bison issue was still something that people were butting heads about. Um, and I felt far away from these things in some ways. And I felt like I wanted to know them more closely. And so I was trying to pay attention. Um, and then I also happened to read for the first time during that period, uh, Eudora Welty's amazing story, Where Is the Voice Coming From? Mm. In which she she hears about the murder of the civil rights leader, Medgar Evers, also, a, also from Jackson, Mississippi, as she was. She's a white woman. She's living in New York City at the time. She hears that Medgar Evers has been murdered. And her first thought, at least in an interview she, she gave later, was, I know who did it. Um, not that she knew the exact name of the person, but she said, because whoever did it was my people. Um, and so thinking about that and looking back West, I, I began to think about, okay, um, though I, though I'm angry, though I, I don't want to agree. Maybe, maybe these are, this is my people and I need to think about that and hear their voices for a moment and making that space led to Verl. Um, though, as you say, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a crazy, scary place to be <laughs> in Verl's voice. Um, and and I wrote this piece that was pretty, pretty short, but really intense. Um, and then, and then it was in the magazine and a friend called up and he was like, where's everybody else? I said, what do you mean? He said, everybody else, because what this guy's done is going to fracture and send all kinds of, of sort of things down through this community. And I thought, oh, of course you're right. Yes. This isn't, this isn't the only voice to listen to. I have to listen to other voices. And so that's sort of where the novel was born. Yeah, you, you have a way with dads. <laughs> and, um, you know, the, the male voice. And I, I remember when mm -hmm. your memoir came out and uh, Ursula Le Guin, you know, was, was she said, it's, it's gendered. <laughs> and I remember telling her it was about a guy and his dad. Um, <laughs> Which I think is an interesting, I've never forgotten that. And yeah. it started haunting me in what I wrote. You uh, know, I'm really interested in, in yeah. how men negotiate this world and how, how women negotiate the world and mm -hmm. where's the interface. And I think it, it was really interesting, this is kind of a slightly rambling thing, but that you brought up Eudora Welty. Yeah. Because especially in this novel, in some weird way, she kind of haunted me as I read the book. And I thought, this is, because I thought it'd be like a, you know, having a good old Tom McGuane experience reading it. Yeah, yeah. And, and I realized what it is. Those, if I have any students, they're already rolling their eyes if they're listening, because I, I, I teach a worn path a lot. And what, what, mo what really moved me about what you're doing with your prose is something that she was so adept at. And that was what my students and I have come to call the understory, letting all this landscape and, and weather and uh, a color and all these things tell a, a story, a subterranean indirect narration. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was curious craft wise, since Pam started us on that path, um, you know, is that, is that part of your design? Cause I know you're a poet, yeah. So I think you, I think you have, you know, nefarious things going on. <laughs> Poser. Um, well, I'll, I'll quote you in return, Luis, um, because I often quote you to my students when you said that, you know, we're not writing setting, we're writing biographies, right? We're writing right. our grandmother, our grandfather. We're not writing about a canyon or a, or a mountain. We're writing, 
writing about someone who lives and someone who should live in our hearts. Um, and for me, that that is absolutely true. Growing up in Eastern Montana, um, landscape was one of the things I had. Uh, it was the place I went to figure myself out. When I was angry, I would go crawl through the irrigation ditch and yeah, you know, throw throw clods at things. And uh, when I when I wanted to explore, I'd wander the fields out to the cottonwoods. Um, it was something that allowed me to be me. And so the landscape works that same way with characters, I think, for me, is it allows them to be them. It allows them to try to find themselves, sometimes to mistake themselves, but hopefully eventually to try to find themselves. Um, yeah, I hope, hope that kind of answers your question. Yeah, yeah, it, it brings to mind, I guess, was it Stegner that, that talked about you know, in Western literature, landscape is a character just like the people. Yeah. And um, I, I was lucky enough to to be semi-mentored a little bit by Vine Deloria back in the day when I was mm -hmm. working Bird's daughter. And he used to tell me this thing. He'd say, you know, we don't live in a place. We live in a story. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And two different people could be in the same place and write a complete, yeah. have a different story for it. Yeah. And that's come to haunt me a lot you know as a writer but also as a reader like what story what story yeah. are you in of yeah. that place and if i were to you know i think you're you're for me becoming a go-to montana voice oh you know, i have certain montana writers that i do i i love tom mcguane yeah. i love his work but uh it seems uh in some ways similar to your work but also very different yeah you know he's telling a different story about that place well, I think, I mean, I think we could widen that too to talk about just rural America in general, which of course got all of a sudden loads of loads of press after the 2016 election. And perhaps now too is getting loads of press as we see these these um, protests. Um, yeah. But I think I think of, of your all's work, Pam, I think of Deep Creek um, and the way you're redefining being in a rural space. Um, I think of, of um, the Devil's Highway and how, how you're looking at this long stretch of rural space that is so contested, so political. Um, and I do think that's the case, that, that these, these spaces need new stories, more stories, um, need fuller, truer, more nuanced, complicated stories. Uh, because in some ways, the story that both too often is told in those places isn't working anymore. And the story that's told about those places isn't true anymore. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I guess that's the th thing I was thinking about the most today when I revisited Fall Back Down When I Die. I, I read it, you know, about eight months before it came out. So that's kind of a long time ago now. So I spent a little time with it, getting back into the characters and hearing their voices today. And, you know, I was thinking about all those articles from the New York Times in 2016 told us that we were elitist and that we sh had left behind these people and uh. we deserved to be the subject of their wrath. And I didn't really buy it in 2016 either, but especially not now, you know, um, because um, the damage mm -hmm. uh, is immeasurable now. Um, and I had a little bit of a different experience. I mean, I mean, obviously the novel's so emotionally complex and, um, you know, Wendell goes through an amazing transformation and, you know, obviously this book is an example of what you're saying, which is that we need new stories that are more emotionally complex and, you know, contain a lot more nuance than just like the man, the men with guns and the, you know, the New Yorkers who fly to Aspen or whatever. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but I have noticed, and perhaps this is because I'm a woman, but I have noticed that my tolerance and my willingness and my desire to feel empathy for men with guns might be at an all time low, <laughs> like, yeah. like, like yeah. after last week. And, you know, I was a hunting guide. I mean, I, yeah. I know guys, you know, I, I spent, weeks and months in the wilds of Alaska with these guys hunting for doll sheep. Like I, I am a spokesman for these guys <laughs> or have been. Um, 
but I'm having a hard time right now. And and yeah. I wonder if you are like, I yeah. wonder if you look at this book and, you know, not think, oh, I was too easy on them. I don't mean that. I just mean like, if you were to write this book right now, would it yeah. be a little different? Like oh. as the havoc that Trump has wreaked on the country with the support of these people, you know, yeah. damaged your outlook about like exactly what you said about you, Dorwalti. These are my people who are doing yeah. this. Yeah. How does that go in your head now? Oh man, that's such a good question, Pam. Um, I think I, I, first off, just as a human being um, living in this world right now, yes, I'm having a really hard time <laughs> trying to find a way to 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 understand um, the men with guns protesting, not being able to get a haircut. Um, it, it makes it, it makes no sense to me. Um, so yeah, I, there, there's no there's no feasible way that connects to real hurt in the world. I guess is what I it, at least that I can see, right? Like it doesn't it doesn't make sense to me. Um, that that said, I, I I sometimes I think sometimes now is especially when when I I need to be careful, right? I need to be careful. Um, and I, I don't know exactly what was going through your door as well as head, but I imagine that was in, in 63 when Meg Gravers is murdered. I imagine she was really trying to understand herself as a Missis as a white Mississippian um, and 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 struggling to do so. Um, and so I do think now is a time for me, especially as a white male from this rural part of the country, to try to be careful and to try to think think about what's going on there, what's going on more widely, um, what my place as a writer is in thinking through these things. Um, and I don't know exactly what it is, but I do want to keep thinking. I want to keep trying to figure it out. Um, and I also don't want to give up for as many morons that are protesting, not get, being able to get a haircut. I know there are probably three or four people back home just trying to keep working, um, going to their jobs, um, making sure the irrigation water is coming down the ditches, um, doing reasonable good work, despite any kind of politics, despite where they might come down on those, on those things. Um, but they're not there. They're not at that protest. And that, that for me, I need to, I need to keep reminding myself of that. I think. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I think, you know, this is a really good time for us to all ask ourselves how we are culpable. You know, I'm culpable because I fly 100,000 miles a year. You know, um, I'm culpable because I have uh, enjoyed the spoils of capitalism, you know, um, not the way the CEO of Exxon has, yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. but in my own way, um, I, you know, I have reap the benefits of the fact that people have enough money to buy, to spend $25 on a hardcover book, you know, or whatever. Like we all participate in this economy. And so I don't mean to point the finger and say, it's all their yeah, yeah. fault. It, I'm, I'm afraid, you know, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not afraid of coronavirus. I'm afraid of men with guns. And, um, and I, and I hear you. I mean, I live surrounded by people who do, who put the irrigation water in the ditches yeah. and who, give my dog um, a shot when they need it and who, you know, make sure that the, the roads are plowed. Um, so my friend who has a severely ill child can get in and out, you know, I, I, I know those guys too. Just, yeah. I, I guess I'm just afraid and yeah. I'm, and I just, I don't know how to live. You know, I'm really struggling with living in this country where, you know, and, and these guys, you know, there's so there's so much violence in this book, you know, and of course, because yeah. that's what the book's about. So it's yeah. not like these are not the guys who are putting, na you know, water in. The no, no. And I, yeah. And I, I think, <laughs> yeah. The woods and shooting each other. Yeah. Right? You yeah. Know? And that's I mean, I do think, too, that that's um, I've got these amazing friends um, in Montana, um, uh, um, Alexis Bonagoski and Mike Scott, who do environmental work there and organic sheep farmers there. Um, and they, they, they have um, for many years uh, been advocating against 
against coal mines and other things in eastern Montana. Um, and they will they often talk about the same thing that many people are ready to talk. Right. They might have vast divides between them, but there are people that are not ready. And it's no use spending your time there. Um, and I think in the book, thinking about Wendell, um, thinking about Wendell's mom, um, they're, they're folks who in some ways you could maybe talk with. Um, and, and Wendell proves that eventually. But then there's other characters mm -hmm. that 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 we should be scared of. That that that, that maybe that's the best reaction. Um, Brian Betts. Um, Verl, though, maybe he tries to find his way to a bit of redemption, um, but but maybe not a whole lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a really interesting thing. I, I, I respond strongly to that, too, and what Pam's saying, too. I, you know, with my Mexican <laughs> roots and, you know, one of the ways I try to deal with this, this uh, fear as well and, and dread about things that are happening um you know and i i know i know you guys do stuff like this too but i spend a lot of my year out doing you know fundraising or hands-on stuff or you know a lot of appearances for terrified ashamed and terrified brown kids and uh, it takes a minute because i walk in and they're like hey who's this gringo man you know <laughs> i speak spanish first <laughs> and we talk about how beautiful they are mm -hmm. and it's really interesting because um you know especially in a in a, a certain uh socioeconomic levels of say latinx culture you know there are not especially for, if you're in a jail or something, it, it, it's not easy to walk up to your brown brother and say, I love you. I'm here because I love you. Cause I'll be like, what? But you try to show them as much respect as you possibly can, you know, in your interaction with them mm -hmm. and try to diffuse the endemic violence of it. Um, and, you know, sometimes I just, you, you mentioned the devil's highway. I was just recently back on the devil's highway physically for the first time since i worked on the book and you know talk about being steeped in awfulness and violence and craziness even then i mean i had to find my way into the border patrol which was makes a funny story on stage but it wasn't funny at the time mm -hmm. and you know the 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 people that were smuggling these men into the united states i was told three times that i'd be killed and i thought killed I'm going to go home to Naperville, Illinois and garden, you know, <laughs> for a book, you know, and at one point, uh, I didn't put it in the original book, but th then in the 10 year anniversary, I felt I could talk about my own experiences, but I was with a friend and we had a car crash with narcos mm. smuggling cocaine <laughs> into Arizona. We crashed into them in a big four wheel drive car and the guy had a gun and, um, Moments like that, you know, you you realize that there's nothing cinematic about it. There's nothing fancy about it. There's nothing John Wayne about it or Clint Eastwood about it. It's just this pissed off person with zero options for a communication except you messed up my ride. I'm gonna shoot you right now, unless you pay me for the for the damage. Yeah. And he started out three hundred dollars or I'll kill you. And neither of us had any money, and we negotiated down. To a six pack of beer and some cigarettes, <laughs> which seemed to me like something out of your book, man. You know, I thought that joke. He's telling the truth, you know. That's amazing it, negotiation. Yeah, it was. It was like in the field, dude with a pistol stuck in his big ugly shorts. The guy next to him with a brick of cocaine in plastic with tape, duct tape. Yeah. And I'm gonna kill you. I'm gonna kill you. And he starts at three hundred, two fifty. 150 100 50 dollars we said we don't have 50 bucks and so he says there's a chicken booth down there man he says, i swear to god if you're not there when i get you i'll find you and kill you and we're like what do you want and he said i want a carton of cigarettes and some beer <laughs> it's a scene from your book man I think, but you know, it's real it's real well i think about the violence i've seen uh, yeah. up, um and it's almost all utilitarian and that's at its best right that's when it's best is when it's utilitarian when it's when it's to feed somebody when it's to ease suffering of some kind hmm. 
and then and then the rest of it is ugly. They're all, and we live in a world where, and I think this is a world that uh, you mentioned John Wayne. I think the John Wayne Westerns have prepared us for a world where violence is beautiful, where violence is lovely somehow, that it fixes things, right? Right. right? John Wayne fixes things. He's violent and he fixes things. And then we have all these people on these movie screens fixing things via violence. And it's often very really lovely and, and choreographed and, and quite nice. Um, but the violence I've seen in my own life, when I've seen people pull guns on one another, it's ugly. And it's, yeah. it's, it's sad and absolutely ungraceful. There's nothing, there's nothing, nothing interesting about it beyond fear right? You're just scared and you want out of there. Um, and that's one of these, again, these myths of the West that I think is a myth of this country as well. That just isn't true. Violence doesn't solve stuff. It doesn't fix stuff. Um, the best it can be is utilitarian. That, that's, that's at its best. And then after that, it falls apart. It doesn't do anything. Now we'll meditate on that. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I think, you know, I, I mean, I, I feel kind of silly saying this here, sitting here literally between the two of you in virtual reality. Um, yeah. or at least I'm in the middle of you on my screen. I don't know yeah. how it is to you. <laughs> but, um, but in any case, like, I have this feeling, I have this deep hope that this virus and, um, the economic fallout uh, that comes as a result of it, which I think is unimaginable to us. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think it's possible that we're going to stop loving those stories. Of oh, yeah, right. Yeah. And I also think it's possible that we're going to stop letting men rule the world because mm. I hope it's kind of fun, uh, pretty bad, you know, um, it's yeah. it's sort of inarguable right at this moment that it's yeah. gone really downhill really quickly um, with men at the helm. Not that they didn't hold it together for a while, but I think it's you know I think and again like that's what I was thinking about when yeah. I was looking at fall back down when I die. Like it's a good old western and it's also a super contemporized, thoughtful, emotionally complicated version. But it's also a good old western, you know where. A bunch of yep. guys go out in the woods and they chase each other and a lot of them end up dead, you know? Um, and it's exciting for that, you know? It's exciting and also tender for that. I mean, the, you know, the sacrifice that Wendell makes, I don't want to... So yeah. I have realized that two of my questions had... Yeah. Away the end. <laughs> so I'm not going to do yeah. that. But in any <laughs> case, um, you know, I, I, again, it's like maybe it's the whole mythology that has to change. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I get too grand because we don't have all night, but, but maybe it's the mythology that has to change. Yeah. It like, um, that it's like, we have, you know, we go outside the box. Yeah. Us and them or outside the box of, um, you know, good government or bad government or all these different things. You know, you read that part about the yeah. slashing of the tires, which I thought was a, a really good choice because that's right at the yeah. heart of the book, you know, yeah. good, good government, bad government. Like yeah. maybe, you know, maybe this is an op or, you know, just something as simple as, you know, we're all environmentalists here. Something that's as simple as like, would we rather be able to breathe and have some weeds? Like, I yeah. think so. I personally oh, yeah. would would yeah. have some weeds and let's get rid of Roundup so we can breathe. Like, like, and maybe this disease that has taken away our breath and taken away our livelihoods and taken away so much from us, not to mention the people it's taken so much more right. from than it's taken from us. Like maybe it's time to remake the whole myth, you know, like the whole paradigm, like, and you know, what's outside the box that's yeah. outside the box. I, I don't know the answer, but I feel like, if there's one thing that this is revealed, it's that we're asking the wrong questions. Yeah. No, I, I, I absolutely agree. And I think in some ways, I mean, the book is definitely a Western. Um, it's set in the West. There's, there's all the trappings of it. Um, but, I, you know, Wendell, Wendell is in some ways, at least in my mind, I'm, I tried to do this anyway. He is, he is domestically 
brave, right? Like his bravery isn't a bravery of, I will be tougher than you. His bravery is, I will care for those who are with me as best I can. Um, and, and I wanted his bravery, his heroism, if there is any, to be that kind of heroism, right? To be the kind of heroism that is counter to, to those Westerns that say, the only bravery is to, is to exert violence on some other. Um, and say, no, the, the real bravery is to try to be with some other and to try to protect them. Um, but again, I, it's so, and even I, I find it too with my kids. I mean, you know, we're, we're here <laughs> sheltering at home and we're doing pretty good with homeschool. We are watching more movies than we have in the past. <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> and some of these movies I enjoy, you know, we watch Star Wars and there's many parts of it I admire and I think, oh, this is a wonderful narrative. But at the same time, it's so steeped in that Western, that Western myth. Um, it is so a part of things. And I, it's, it's working on us in subtle and insidious ways, always, I think. And we do absolutely have to push against it, find new stories to tell, to, to, to allow ourselves not to be so influenced by that particular story. Yeah. Well, and also, I know you want in, Luis, and I'm going to shut up for a minute. But no, I, no, I, the, other, the other thing I'm thinking, and this is part of what Jericho Brown and I were talking about last night, but, but like one thing this virus has done, I saw someone on the side said, you know, the, the, the virus is, you know, the fact that the virus is global removes some of our ability to do good, good guy, bad guy things. Mm -hmm. And that's, mm -hmm. that's true. That, that's that's all, but it also has revealed, you know, so many of the lies that are at the, at yeah. the rock bottom yeah. of American culture. Yeah. Um, and that makes me hopeful that we could remove some more of the lies, you know, like so much of our yeah. whole society is founded on the lies. And, and one of the things your, your most violent characters buy into are those lies, you know, and, yes, and Wendell is starting to see that that was all a lie, which is what is allow him his tenderness, you know, in the book. And, and like, maybe that's another hopeful thing that could happen, you know, that, that we could stop lying about how we treat black and brown people. We could stop lying about how we treat women. We could, I mean, again, I don't mean to be like yeah. super Pollyanna. I just, I have to think of where we are as an opportunity and we are being revealed so yeah. dramatically yeah. every yeah. day, you yeah. know, to the world and to each other. Like, God, if we could just go with that, if we could just run with that, mm -hmm. you know, like there'd be a million Wendells, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's that would be a nice fate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you know, I agree with you. I think I think that this pandemic has changed things possibly forever i know people you know fret about uh uh you know will we ever have sporting events again will we ever go see the rolling stones again blah 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 um but i've noticed a, a, an immense opening of tenderness uh and sometimes you know any tender act reduces people to tears and you see it yeah. all the time these moments of kindness that i think you know maybe it took our shock to stop and here we are yeah. we are you know in my neighborhood little things there's a little boy had a birthday and he couldn't see anybody and so his mom and dad drove him down the street in the minivan with the roof open and all the neighbors raised hell and this little guy was waving, you know. Um, one of the neighbors, I don't know who, it was anonymous, they invested in making orange flags with smiley faces and they put on the flag stand on in every lawn in the neighborhood, yeah. smiley face flag. And everybody came out and just stared at them like, oh my God, you know. Little details like that move me. Yeah. And, you know, I all the communities I'm, involved with it do things to save people you know um they're working overtime they haven't stopped they're out there you know doing the work and they're seeing awful 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 things yet i i can't help but hope 
you know, that even the, the nastiest of us might just stop for a second and say, that didn't work. I think Pam's totally right. Are we really going to listen to another uh, line of insane, lying rhetoric, you know, testosterone poisoned rhetoric? I don't think we are. Yeah. I hope we know. You know, and at the beginning, I kept saying, you know, if Elizabeth Warren were president, this crap wouldn't be happening. Right? <laughs> oh, imagine if we had a leader. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah, a leader who would tell the truth. Yeah, yeah. You know, and not have all these odd complexes, whatever they are. I, yeah. You know, so I, I'm, I'm with you, Pam, totally. I want to hear, I want to hear that all day long, because I think, I think that's our hope. And, you know, just, just to watch videos from around the globe of clean air yeah, yeah this short period of time the air is you know it's like mother nature is saying i'm going to try to do a lot of repair real fast you know animals showing up uh it's it's an amazing thing let's hope the bees can come back <laughs> <laughs> i know it's been i mean um I know I'm speaking. I'm thinking about my family here. Um, we we were in we're in far north country of New York, um, a small town um, on a college campus that's empty of college students. Um, and I've I've sort of congratulated myself for many years, thinking that I live, I live a pretty reasonable life, right? Like my my carbon footprint is low, and I'm try to be try to try to be someone active in the community in ways that I can. Um, and this is making me rethink all that. Um, I think, mm -hmm. wow, your carbon footprint wasn't that low. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> I'm thinking about, oh, did you really need to order that thing the other, you know, two months ago? Um, there is a way in which it's not, there's a way in which I do think that this experience could be kind of a shared experience that that will unite, that will help us understand tenderness and kindness in a new way and, and the absolute necessity of tenderness and kindness um, in our lives. I also think it might be a space too to look at our own lives. Um, those of us um, who, who are feeling pretty good about those lives or those of us who are struggling in those lives, um, it's a chance to it's a chance to look at them and, and take stock for a moment um, and to understand maybe what matters most or what what is important and what what can be maybe be done without or what can be done differently um my kids of course too are yeah. learning all these things uh, my son's calculating carbon footprints right now as we speak uh, and we've, we've had to own up to some things <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah but you know it i i i do think that that our our gestures, our motions, our choices, as small as they may be, are part of this massive thing that's happening. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I, you guys will understand this. I know. It, you know, Pam talked about 100,000 miles a year. I mean, you know, it got to the point when I, I, I honestly was thinking, please, something happened so that I don't go out on the road all the time. Yeah. Well, it happened. And you know what happened? I started writing again. Wow, you know, it started flying. And yeah. then you know what happened? I rediscovered our our yard, which uh, I haven't seen yeah. for years. Now I'm gardening like a crazy bastard. You know, we've got <laughs> vegetables growing. We're putting in strawberries. You know, I think that's a really wonderful thing. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. You know, <laughs> What putting is, in uh, milkweed to attract monarchs, you know, just cool stuff. Yeah. And you know, in my little corner here, I'm doing, and I think my neighbors are all doing it too. Yeah. I yeah. wish we lived out in, you know, the Wallalas or someplace, but, <laughs> you know, but uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful. Yeah. And I, I think I may seem like a, you know, a hippie moron, but I am hopeful. I feel that tide is at least lapping at the shore you know that's in some strange ways i feel like i'm i'm ringing back to my own childhood in eastern montana ah. a pre-internet childhood a childhood where what we paid attention to was close but what mattered was close right when the goldfinches were back that mattered when 
when this is blooming that mattered when we could when we could when the river was running this high it mattered there's a way in which like everything that was close mattered so much and then and then this other life i lead feels so much out here and yeah. out sucked back in um and and maybe there's a maybe there's a way to sort of navigate those two things more gracefully but i i do think that maybe we've sacrificed what is close often yeah yeah i think that's absolutely true i mean i i just keep saying maybe i didn't need that many choices you know maybe yeah. i was suffering from too many choices and um you know, I feel like those, I'm sure you read about the 77,000 people in China who didn't die because the air got clear for two months or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. That was uh, yeah. Forbes, I think. 77,000 yeah. people did not die because of the clean air. I sort of feel like if the COVID doesn't kill me, it's going to give me 10 extra years because yeah. <laughs> I'm getting sleep for the first time in decades. I'm. <laughs> And I don't, you know, I'm cooking. I think lots of people are learning to cook. I, I, I'm a pretty good cook. Like, I think people are doing, I used to love being a river guide because, mm. and the thing I loved most about being a river guide, which I was for about a decade uh, on multi-day trips, sometimes as long as two weeks or 21 days. The thing I loved most about it was that the whole day was taken up. Now I know this is artificial on a river trip, yeah. but the whole day, day was taken up with like your basic needs. The whole yeah. day was taken up yeah. with making your few miles, making your eight or 10 or 12 miles, finding a place to sleep that was comfortable, making a meal, making sure all your people had their tents set up right and had their beds right, you know, uh, sitting by the river, telling stories, going to bed, waking up and doing it all over again. And mm -hmm. There was a simplicity to that life about, you know, hunter gatherer need meeting or whatever that it was that felt really excellent. Yes. And, and I, as I say all this, I just want to say how lucky I am that I'm not yeah. front line, that I'm not a nurse, that I don't work in a grocery store. You know, yeah. have the yeah. luxury to feel all this and say all this and enjoy my my yeah. seven hours of sleep a night and my you know my fresh turmeric in my stew or whatever <laughs> but um yeah but i do think you're right joe i mean i think what is close is valuable and especially for some of us who just got on this treadmill of saying yes to everything which i know Luis, that you are like me that way i don't know how much yes you say joe but i i said yes to everything because of my work ethic and because of my father saying you know take it take it when you can because it's all gonna go away you know like all these all these capitalistic yeah. reasons that i was never home making a stew with fresh turmeric or getting seven hours of sleep a night and i i do think that's why yeah. i mean i don't i don't i every every word out of my mouth comes with this knowledge of all the suffering that's happening and i don't mean to make light of it or yeah. congratulate sure. it in any way but it is, I do think I'm learning that I could live a much different life than I've been living. I was just going to jump in and say one of the, one of the problems, though, for both of you is that you're such amazing readers and speakers that people are always asking you for things. So <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying it's your own fault, but, but you're just really good as part of the truth. <laughs> yeah, we're trying to suck, Joe. We're trying to get work. <laughs> No, but you know, it's, it's again, though, you talk about tenderness and things. I mean, I don't want to sound too, you know, too mystical or, or new agey, but it is a, it is a gift that you bring to people and it's showing them respect and love. You know, if you can try to do the best you can for them when you're up in that unbelievably privileged spot at a mic, you know, in an auditorium with a spotlight, yeah. you've given it to them. I think Pam does that brilliantly yeah. by by helping people to write yeah. in cool places you know i mean look how did, how did we meet we met out at a cool place where people were being helped to write man. Yeah. you know and just that to me is the beautiful dichotomy we're talking about that you know there you are i shan't name the spot because i don't want to criticize anybody but out in eastern oregon in the beautiful beautiful gorgeous mystical everything 
main street of the town is just heaven on earth. One block away from the main street of the town is the guys with the guns, kill all wolves. You know, one of the guys changed yeah. the name of his street to Trump Way. And they don't, they're very suspicious of this communistic bunch of weird liberals. That, <laughs> that the first yeah. time we met with Ursula Le Guin? Was that the first time we met? Uh, it might have been. Yeah. Uh -huh. It might have been. <laughs> that was Good old Ursula. Ursula, you know, she, she, I, I met her when I was in college. She, she was my discoverer. Yeah. And uh, I think about a lot of the stuff she said. I, I think about it with both of you, especially in this conversation, something she said to me, which I talk about a lot with my writing students, but she told me, you know, writers are the raw nerve of the universe. Mm -hmm. And our job is to go out and feel things for a culture that's forgotten how to feel. Uh. We don't have a ritual anymore. We don't have a morning fire. We don't respect our elders. We don't take our dream from last night to the old woman and say, what does it mean? So she can tell you. So we go out and do this and then we put it in books to try to help people remember how to feel. Mm -hmm. And it just haunted, it, it's always haunted me. I was probably 19 when she told me that, and I, you know, impressionable eyes like this because it's Ursula Le Guin, but that was so wise. I don't forget it. Have and you I read think the story of yours called Sir? Have either of you read that story called Sir uh, S U R? Sir. I don't think I, so. I don't think I, I have. Read okay. it tonight. I'm, All right. Okay. It's a story. I'll just give you the brief plot line without ruining anything, which is my seems to be my habit. Uh, <laughs> but a bunch of women decide that they're going to go to the South Pole. And ah. it's back in like, I don't, I can't remember now. It's been so many years since I read it, but it's maybe in the fifties or the sixties, mm -hmm. but they're going to go the 1960s that is, and they're going to go to the South pole and they, it's an all women exposition expedition and they get there. Um, and they decide not to leave um, a flag because they don't mm -hmm. want to damage the male ego of the, <laughs> of the men who will come and, find it i, I guess it. i guess it must be before it must not be the 60s i i sort of blew this must have been like before anyway before the before the, that. but it's a beautiful story it's so subtle and you don't quite realize like you actually think when you're reading the story is this true <laughs> like, <laughs> when did it first you know and then of course you realize like, Gwen being or something but it's it's a glorious story. That huh. that time we met, Luis, um, I had just started dating someone that I I am no longer with, um, and I said at that dinner, I said, "No, I got because I he had sent flowers when I arrived in this in this town we're not naming, and <laughs> um, and and I said, oh, I, I got flowers, and you know, I." I, he's not a guy who sends flowers. And Ursula said, well, it seems he knew how. <laughs> <laughs> That's like that so the, first thing, the first thing <laughs> Ursula ever said to me was that I did it. <laughs> <laughs> she was something. I missed her. I missed her a lot. Yeah, she changed everything. I remember her telling me when I was about 20, she said, Luisito, it's time for you to become a feminist. I thought, <laughs> what? What's that? You know? <laughs> she she definitely re-engineered my direction. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I talk about someone too who told new stories, as we were talking about earlier. Someone who yeah. who re-engineered the myths, who who dipped into the fantasy and the sci-fi and all that stuff where we often see the myths most most pronounced and yeah. uh, Retold them, yeah. Totally. Yeah. Someone, someone on the chat thing has said that it was first published. It, sir, my story, that story, Ursula's story, was first published in the New Yorker in 1982, ah. and it was ah. in 1909. So thank okay. you for that. Moment. <laughs> thank you. Nice. Right. Good. 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 Uh, speaking of that, I, I was just thinking maybe we should. Uh, Look quickly at question. Oh, Melanie, hello. Hi. Hi. Yes, I was gonna say maybe we have time for like one question. Oh no, we talked too much. 
<laughs> That's okay. I think I think actually you ended up kind of addressing a lot of the things that the questions were about. Um, do you do you guys want to look through and choose, or would you like me to read one for you? Oh, do we put a different button for that? Yeah, it's ask a question at the bottom of the screen. Yeah, see. Hmm. Hmm. Just pick one. Just pick one. Yeah, mo something. Let's go back to Joe's book to finish it off. Something. Yeah. Those that are about yeah. Joe's book. Talk about Joe's book. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> um, boy, these are so. These are so good. These are. These are all of the the sort of the the bigger themes we've been talking about. Um, Hmm. Let's. Oh boy. Um, okay. So this is this is going to take us beyond the book, but that's fine. Um, how can we worry about the reality of guys and guns and violence as a response to an impasse when the only literature that many such males are exposed to is the crime guns shows on TV and the violent video games even grown men play? That sad machismo is 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 um, dinning into their ears. So how do we tell new stories to ears that are full of full of the wrong stuff already? Um, do we tell stories to those ears? Is that is that part of the project? Maybe. Uh, wow. Well, don't you? I mean, in terms of our combo we've just had, yeah. Don't you think that that palette is changing a little bit? That flavor might not be as pleasing i don't know yeah, yeah. maybe right maybe i many of those guys i know aren't going to start reading haiku that's for sure no no no, no. perhaps there's well, a moment they're not gonna start reading joe wilkins you know like they're yeah, not gonna, you know yeah. they're not going to read a, a contemporized western either i mean i think you know i think hollywood is the key to that you know i really do yeah. i mean just if being practical uh yeah. or or TV and movies like I think you know the success of Parasite and the success of Moonlight a few years ago are just really good signs you know in that regard I mean I'm not I mean I think the question I mean I think the real answer to the question is it's impossible you know and so you know we should just weep but I do think um, you know large scale entertainment um, or you know graphic novels and comic books yeah. like I think yep things that are happening there. Yeah. Um, I think there are places uh, that, um, that, that the, 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 the subject matter is bending, you know? Yeah. Uh, well, it's bent uh, and broadening. I mean, much in the same way your book broadens it, you know? Uh, but I don't know about people who don't read yeah. literary novels. You know, I don't know how to reach them some other way. Well, I, I think about it too. Which of course is most of the people. <laughs> right, it's so many people, too many people. <laughs> but, but I'm thinking about it like longitudinally as well. Um, I was one of those boys in a rural area raised on all the same stuff, um, absolutely the same stuff. And looking, looking, because my dad died when I was so young, looking for, for a way to be a male in this in this world. And it was it was teachers who pushed me to books that helped me find, and of course my mother, who, who helped me find a way to be otherwise in the world. And so I'm thinking about, there are those boys in every rural space right now. There's a boy whose dad was marching in some capital with his gun, who, who isn't his father's son and who, who, who wants another story and, and, and hopefully there's, there's a teacher, there's a, there's a mom, there's an aunt, there's somebody who will maybe hand him another story. Um, and I think, again, it's, it's long work, but I, I do think that that's the work you have to do by the time they're marching on the Capitol with the guns. I'm, I'm not sure that we can, we can have too much of a conversation, but early on, I think maybe we can. I knew so many of those boys and many of them were, were good at heart when they were 12, when they were 14. Mm -hmm. I don't know now, you know? Mm -hmm.